Happy Friday and welcome to the SIP Hour, your go-to space for and by Black women for us to gather, to be informed, engage, and to take action. Welcome today's SIP host, Judith Brown Dianis. Agent Shropshire is back in the house. Hey. I'm in the car. Tracy Sturdivant and Fatima Gosgraves are off. But guess what? Our girl and guest contributor, Sonia Lockett's here. Sonia! Welcome back. Welcome back. Yay. So let us know where you're watching from. I mean, pretty much any part of this country has something going on um, weather related. So if you're on the uh, West Coast, I mean, on the uh, East Coast, you're swimming or no power power outage. If you are anywhere else in the country, it's 135 degrees. Um, so we might be hitting some records. So let us know where you are watching from. And more importantly, invite your crew to join us by sharing the feed. But before we start today's show, all of the black girl magic that hit my social media last night for that little girl from in our resident Louisiana little girl is going to chime in. Uh, uh, Zaila, Zaila uh, Avant Garde last night was crowned the first African American contestant to the Scribs National Spelling Bee, spelling a bunch of words. I don't even know what they are. Um, <laughs> Not uh, a clue. But she also is winning for a thousand reasons. This young lady also holds three Guinness Book of World Records for dribbling multiple basketballs simultaneously. Um, and so, indeed, every day we are waking up to Black Girl Magic. So, what did y'all think um, last night? I'm going to start with uh, Sonia, who is. It's the 504, y'all. 504. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, just first of all, the little, the Black Girl twirl. Yeah. How about you on the twirl? avant-garde just you know just that beauty the beauty of her saying yes i'm going to play in the wbmba before i go work at nasa i mean everything right. it is everything it is just everything about black girl magic that we love it is everything about the boot you know how we do down here and i mean it's just this I love that little black girls are seeing all of this magic that just keeps keeps in this crazy world to remind them like, we can do this. I love it. I was so excited. The twirl was just so sweet. And then, you know, of course, because my daughter plays basketball, this is me, early morning. Do you see her moves? Can you do that? <laughs> I know you're playing D1 ball, but look at her. She's coming for your spot. She's coming for you. She's in New Orleans also. So I'm like, oh, y'all need to start recruiting her right now. Baby. So, yeah. So it's just absolutely beautiful. I suppose, you know, because anybody who loved the movie Aquila and the Bee, <laughs> like to see it come to reality was just like, just wonderful. Well, that was my first thought, actually. I was both like, wait, what happened to that other little black girl that won? But no, that was a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't actually happen but it made me think about like how underrated that movie is well because i, I watch that movie every time it comes on i love I that i watched movie. that movie 500 her little hand <laughs> hit her little thing yes exactly it was such it's such an underrated movie i love it and but it, it presents it was like the possibility right it's like why do we think that there could be a black president? Because there was 14 television shows with a black president, right? <laughs> um, so I really do think that, that I, that's the first thing that I thought about. And then when I watched her dribbling in basketballs, I was like, my head hurts. Like, I don't understand the, the processes in her brain that allow her to do all of that juggling. So just a brilliant young woman. I just thought it was great. And in my other piece around representation, and she rocked her little afro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at a time where we are still arguing and debating things around how black women wear their hair. And here's this confident, overconfident, you know, young lady who, again, can spell all of us under five tables, um, who also shows that we're well-rounded. Um, and not in multi generational, uh, multi dimensional, and multi um, dimensional. And I think she's a tween. Is she only like thirteen? She's yeah, a she's teen, a I think right? she's a tween. Like, well, I guess that's a teen. The, the beginning of teen. So, um, uh, what, um, what was the winning word? Mm -hmm. 
Mara something. Something that was Swedish, <laughs> something, something. Mariah. 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 Like, how do you pronounce it? Mariah? Like Mariah Carey? Or like... I would have been M A R I A. Exactly. Mariah no? Carey, right? Mar Mar Maria. 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 Yeah. M U R R something. We can't even pronounce it, let alone spell it. We only know how to spell it because we done seen it. Guess times. what? We are, we are good. As my brother, one of my brothers, like, I'm very good at the one thing I know how to do. And so <laughs> we're going to continue to be great on our thing. So since the last time Sonia um, hung out with us, which was Mardi Gras, she was during Lent, so she wasn't drinking. So she's actually sipping today. Uh, and. She's been a little busy today uh, in her day job, um, doing some really fun things that are about to come out. Share a little bit about it. So i um, really excited um, that uh, we are part of, with MGM and Braun, the Aretha Franklin biopic, Respect. Coming out on August 13th, people. Um, right. Put on your mask and go to the theater because you want to hear this music. Um, it is, a, you know, I'm really, really proud of it. It's an amazing, uh, film. Jennifer Hudson is amazing. Uh, you have Mary J. Blige, Audra McDonald, wow. Heather Headley, wow. um, Forrest Whitaker, Marlon Wayans, who is, is fantastic. Um, the music it's, uh, and it's just, when we talk about, uh, black women and especially the audience usually for 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 this um it really shows uh aretha coming into her own as a woman female empowerment and it really also uh really shows who she was as an activist mm -hmm. and um pushing forth that and then just the music and so really excited about that and um we are doing i've been working on a social impact campaign that will be aligning with that and hopefully i can come back and talk more about that at yes. a, a later date um but just really um really excited about this i really think when we talk about music when we talk about women when we talk about change makers aretha is right up there and i think this um film really is a a really beautiful um tribute to who she was and who she was in our in our kind of lexicon of of, of black um black icons and so august 13th everyone i did not know that audra mcdonald was in who's she playing who's she I, girl audra plays her mother I didn't know wow that. yes audra plays her mother um mary j blige plays dinah washington mm -hmm. and heather headley plays claire ward i can see that with yeah yeah i love this i did not know all those folks were in oh, yeah i know i didn't know either that's Ars cool. whitaker plays her father yeah um yeah Is Marlon you playing one of the husbands right? yes and i when i tell you i think of marlon wayans like white girls and crazy he is so good um he's so good in this so i can't wait uh, i i'm excited i'm excited for everyone to see it so is it just called Aretha? Is that it's called respect? Respect. Okay. That's great. <laughs> and black, you know, Liesel Le Tommy directing, black female director. Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's good. It's you have good. such a cool job. I just wanna, I just wanna I know. on that. It's good. <laughs> I, you know, I like it. I, you know, he's one of our cool friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you might. It, yes, one of uh, less than a handful of cool friends. <laughs> <laughs> Not less than a handful. <laughs> we are own. We are own friends, y'all, and we invite ourselves to our own tables because we don't always get invited to all the big things. <laughs> Can I tell you what I'm sipping? Because we do. Please I do. actually am sipping this time. What you sip? Just a little gentleman Jack. Oh, nice. Oh. Yes, because the last Wait time. Up. Is that straight up or what? Straight up. 
Well, on the rocks, little, on little, the rocks. little rocks. I'm gonna have a Cosmo later, and that's in honor of my dad. My dad had passed away like 19 years ago today. It's his birthday. Oh, salute, Carol him. Brown Day. So we gotta have a Cosmo. No, we should have done that, Judith. I will have one with you later on. Okay, okay. I'll have another because it's been this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a hurricane when you were on last time, and that was the first time I'd had a hurricane. I was like, really? <laughs> And I couldn't have it. Yeah, you could not have it. Y'all had me on like two or three times during Lent and everyone's like, woo, and I'm like, I have water. I'm detoxing <laughs> from my little vacation, which was, I'm a big rum drinker. And so the um, place we stayed, their mixologist, which was uh, this black woman who has won, she does, um, she goes around the world doing these competitions for the resort that she works for. And she's she came in third and she does like rum. And so... Mm. Um, I'm detoxing. That was your, I'm, that was your heaven. The that was, was like everybody that was, was also this humble brag about her vacation. Well, we will. Well, <laughs> I know we have to toss on the back, and if y'all stay with us, um, Adrian will do just a slight humble brag about you know her jumping off of things and things. I was like, oh, is you out in these streets jumping into that big ocean? Except her brag ain't humble. We whatever. We ain't gonna talk about it. But we have a guest. Let's get to our guest. This is a big guess. This is important. So really excited. You know, we started these coffee conversations to bring in black women who are just doing incredible things in their in their field. And today we have Deborah Archer, who is, first of all, a smarty pants lawyer like myself. <laughs> um, but Deborah um, is the director of the Center on Race inequality and the law at NYU School of Law. But hold on, hold on. A crown achievement recently is that Deborah is the new president of the American Civil Liberties Union, also known as the ACLU, and is the first black woman to be president of the ACLU. So welcome Deborah to the SIP. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I don't have anything to sip, though. That well, well yeah. I know you're like the rest of us. We didn't get the memo that yeah. went down. Today's a dry day, so, for but that doesn't seem to count here. It's, it's <laughs> it counts. So, so Deborah, let's. Um, I just want to start off, you know, as um, someone who practices civil rights and has known of you. Can't remember if we met. We're like, oh, did we meet? we both were at the Legal Defense Fund at some point. Um, so, you know, being the president of the ACLU is a big deal, and you've made history in um, in that role. And so, tell us a little bit about what that means for the organization, um, and what shifts you think you've already made and you plan to make as um, the first Black president of the ACLU. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for that. It has been an incredibly exciting few months. The ACLU has been an important part of my professional life for about two and a half decades. I started my legal career there as a fellow before moving on to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, in large part because I'm passionate about the issues the ACLU works on. A lot of them have touched my life and my family's life personally. So to have the opportunity to serve as president now and during this time, it really is an honor an incredible opportunity to impact the protection of civil rights and civil liberties, which has been the focus of my um, career. And it has not been lost on me, the importance and the obligation and the responsibility of being the first black woman, actually the first person of color mm -hmm. uh, to achieve this. I think every time black women achieve one of these firsts, uh, whether it's in government or civic leadership or business or politics, it really honors the black women who have came, come before, who may not have been able to get to that level, but were there to fight and they fought and led and organized and survived just so that this country could be more free so that I could be in this place, that we could be in this place and have the opportunities to serve that we have. So um, being president is just uh, amazing. And I, I do think that being the first black person in any arena always comes with more pressure because there are more eyes on you. Yeah. People often have expectations or assumptions about who you'll be in that role and who you are. And depending on what those expectations are, 
or assumptions are, I either have the responsibility to live up to and fulfill those expectations, like the ones from the amazing, wonderful people who have reached out to me to congratulate me, to say that they've been proud. And I want to make sure that I live up to um, their expectations, that I don't um, show that, the, that their faith in me was misplaced. Um, and so it's been, it's a, it's a lot of pressure, but pressure I welcome. In terms of the organization uh, more broadly, I think for many people, my election holds significance because the ACLU has been at the forefront of the fight for civil liberties uh, for over 100 years. And I am not the kind of person that they envision. Who I am doesn't fit into the narrative they hold about uh, what the ACLU is. And so I hope that my um, position as president is going to add another dimension to the story of the ACLU, help people, more people see themselves in us and in our work. We are um, now an organization where there are 60% of our members of the National Board of Directors are people of color. A lot of our senior leadership in the national office are black women. I'm the president and across the country, we have an incredibly diverse group of leaders. So I hope that after my election, more people will see themselves in the organization and in our work. Mm -hmm. Well, Deborah, um, thinking about sort of new dimensions for their organization, um, earlier this year, the ACLU introduced the systemic equality agenda. Um, and we come, you know, at, at a moment where there is this um, wild campaign against uh, critical race theory that is, in fact, not about critical race theory, um, but the agenda, uh, the, the systemic equality agenda um, is an attempt to get at dismantling a system that is deeply rooted in racist policies um, and particularly that particularly harm uh, folks of color. Um, and that's important because we just finished an entire year really or more, almost two years now of talking about systemic uh, racism, how it shows up in people's lives, how it shows up in our laws, how it shows up in policy. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of what the agenda is attempting to address. Yeah. And as someone who teaches critical race theory, that conversation is incredibly frustrating. That they, what they're not, they're not fighting critical race theory. They really are pushing back against um, an, a show of power in our community, an advancement of a conversation that they feel uncomfortable with. So it's incredibly frustrating. But uh, in terms of the work of the ACLU and our systemic equality agenda, I think at the, at, at the core, our work is about trying to close the gap between the America that was promised and the America that is. And if we're going to achieve that goal, we all have to double down on our focus on challenging how racism has managed to persist in its power over centuries. And that means deepening and expanding our racial justice work. So our systemic equality agenda uh, is trying to focus on eradicating the vestiges of colonialization, of slavery and Jim Crow. We're trying to identify and challenge the modern tools of racial inequality, and we're prioritizing social, political, and economic um, equality. Mm -hmm. I think of it in a few buckets. Uh, the first bucket is that we're trying to reconcile the past. The, the scars that were created by hundreds of years of slavery and Jim Crow, followed by racially discriminatory government policies are deep and they're gonna require real resources and investment in individuals in the communities that have been harmed. So our work here is going to include trying to advance the conversation, help advance the conversation about reparations and challenging laws that perpetuate inequality, particularly around housing, education and the criminal legal system. We're also trying to extend empowerment. The barriers to full participation in the democratic process really undermine black and brown voters' true political power. And so we're going to do work and continue to deepen our work to protect and expand the right to vote. But we're also focused on ensuring uh, a fair redistricting process. In addition to the notorious legislation in Georgia and that we see in Florida and, and in, in Texas, we've seen 361 voter suppression bills in 47 states. Right. Um, and beyond defensive work, we have to explore affirmative efforts to expand the franchise. We're also gonna work to build prosperity. The gaps in wealth between black and white households really exposes accumulated inequality and discrimination as well as differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to the nation's inception. And then finally, I think some of our work would fall into the bucket of increasing access. 
in order to level the playing field so that every person can achieve their highest potential, we have to ensure that every person has access to the tools necessary to, to thrive. Yeah, I would love, and obviously as we um, are halfway through <laughs> through 2021, can y'all believe that y'all? Um, with um, a new president and, um, you know, an interesting Congress, I'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> would love to hear your thoughts or just <laughs> the steps to be able to move this agenda. Uh, and particularly, you know, you could pick, you know, any of the, the issues you've just, um, discuss, but particularly as it relates to, you know, as we're coming out of this global pandemic um, and where the economy and, and where the economy currently sits uh, and that economy uh, shows that obviously black and brown and indigenous people um, are still fighting for our ability to, to not only survive um, in this country, but to thrive. That how do you see the, the agenda, your work, um, our collective work in individual black women, what do we need to do to kind of push um, the current administration and Congress to be able to really imagine what the possibilities that exist around um, closing the racial wealth gap? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenging problem. I think in part because we have not traditionally viewed um, closing the wealth gap as a, an important civil rights issue, but economic justice and racial justice are two sides of the same coin. Economic justice work is critical because it, it supports our ability to access and enjoy other civil rights and civil liberties. And I may get the quote wrong, but Dr. King said um, effectively, what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't have enough money to buy a hamburger? Mm -hmm. So racial justice requires stable jobs and income. It, it requires affordable housing. It requires access to basic financial services. Really, it requires access to the mainstays of an economically vibrant life. And so for us, some of the work we're going to do is around canceling public student debt, which is certainly a racial justice issue and one that impacts black women uh, more than um, other members of the community. Um, accessing financial services through coastal banking for the underbanked. Many black and brown communities don't have a bank branch in their zip code, but all zip codes have a post office. So we're trying to advance um, legislation that would establish postal banking and also establishing a permanent uh, child tax credit. So Deborah, um, last week we talked some on the SIP about the Supreme Court's um, decisions and tried to do a little wrap up of what we saw come out of the Supreme Court, including the um, most recent voting rights case. So we've had a, a, a term with these new justices on the Supreme Court, uh, some people that, you know, they're, you know, they got on through a hard fight. Um, and so what, at this point, what did, how would you read the tea leaves on what we should expect from this court in the future? And I, I think this is important, especially because we're talking about Congress, talking about these state legislatures, and then we have the Supreme Court, right? And so while we see voter suppression moving locally, we see Congress at a stalemate and may not be able to get anything done that we need done for black folks. Um, and then we have the Supreme Court. So what's the tea leaves on like, what we should expect out of this court in the future. Yeah, you mentioned all of the challenges uh, that, that, that we are seeing, the, the reactionary pushback to shows of power through voting, uh, the, the, the way that we see discrimination um, being perpetuated by state legislatures around the country. And I think the sense of relief that some people feel around this court I don't share that <laughs> relief that they they have felt at the end of this term, and certainly any relief that they felt uh, shouldn't extends to questions should not extend to questions of race or gender, sexual orientation, or or gender identity. Uh, I think it's true in many of the cases this term the court was surprisingly bipartisan and uh, did stick to relatively. Uh, narrow holdings, mm -hmm. but all that went down the drain when it came to the court section two case, which I'm sure you talked about in, in detail, in which the court was really trying to distance us from the realities and current impact of our racist history. They don't want to. They didn't want to deal with it, and the decision is a rejection of what the Voting Rights Act was designed to accomplish. 
and doesn't reflect reflect well on the future of other efforts to address the history and reality of racial inequality in America. And I think we've also seen the way that this court dismantles civil rights protections gradually, piece by piece, mm -hmm. over the course of years, as they're doing with the Voting Rights Act right now. Yeah. So we should not be comfortable because some of the losses were narrower than they could have been, because the other shoe may yet to have dropped. So we can't put our guard down, um, and we have to keep fighting. And we should we should be concerned. The court um, has already announced that it's going to decide major cases on abortion, uh, the right to carry concealed guns. It may take up a challenge to the Harvard Affirmative Action Program. We're going to see some of the challenges to the voting restrictions in Georgia or Florida or Texas make its way up to the court, and and we should be concerned. Mm -hmm. Co-host, host, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have so, it's the sip. Sorry, I have so many um, things that uh, prevent me from sleeping at night. What are the social justice issues that are keeping you up? Um, I know the voting piece is, I mean, what, what's keeping, what's keeping you up at night? Like yes. That? So, so, so many. <laughs> I, um, am the mother of two beautiful young black men. One just graduated from high school, uh, this, uh, last month and one just started high school. And so the problem of racialized police violence, particularly against black men, coupled with the weaponization of the police by white people against black people, keeps me up at night. And it keeps me worried through the day, every day, whenever one of them leaves the house. I feel like I'm, I'm holding my breath. I can't breathe deeply until he gets home. And so I deeply appreciate the work that advocates and advocates are doing so that one day my children won't have to worry over their children the way that I have to worry over them. And, and then next, we've talked about it a bit. I would say the systematic state by state assault on voting rights, the barriers and roadblocks to political participation that we are seeing are incredibly dangerous challenges to our democracy because they reflect the desire of some people to hold on to power just completely and indefinitely, particularly in the area of racial justice, but also in so many other areas of civil rights and civil liberties, we're fighting a battle of ideas now. But that doesn't mean anything if those who currently have and exercise disproportionate political power are able to use that power across the country to systematically disenfranchise people of color. And not only does it erect barriers to political participation and ensure that uh, those in power are going to hold on to power, it's going to have an effect on further discouraging people from participating in the political process. And that's how democracies die. When people believe they don't have any political power, and worse, when they may in fact be right that they don't have uh, political power. And then finally, I would say racial segregation. Mm. It's, uh, it doesn't always rise to the level when people are discussing pressing civil rights concerns, but it's an incredibly powerful tool of racial inequality. America remains deeply and profoundly segregated along racial lines. We live separately, we learn separately, we socialize separately, and the systems this country has so effectively built to protect and maintain segregated communities have a tremendous negative impact on those who are left out. And that's because you can't separate the places people have access to from the opportunities people have access to. Mm -hmm. So we always, speaking of uh, this idea of political power, um, sometimes very real and sometimes, um, you know, uh, or not sometimes, like clearly in this moment being eroded. Um, one of the things that we always try and do um, on the SIP is to help those, our viewers, um, you know, understand what it is that they can do, how they can take action, right? What are what are things that they can do in this moment when there's so much? So like, there's all the things that keep us awake at night and they keep us awake at night because they're active, right? Like they are, they, things are moving forward. Um, and so if you uh, were to give one piece um, of advice on what action uh, black women can take in this particular moment, um, what would what would that be? One piece is hard, maybe two quick okay. pieces. You can even do three. Uh, one is I think that we 
we should have learned from the response to the pandemic how important state and local governments are. We should be learning from the attacks on voting rights, from the attacks on uh, transgender youth, on the power that rests within state legislatures. So let, let's not get wait until um, a federal election to get involved. Let's get involved every day at the state level, at our local level. Care about who's on your school board. Um, fight for a community that reflects your values. Mm -hmm. I think there's also things that everyone can do, um, including just not standing by in the face of inequality or in, injustice. I, I think we all need to recognize whatever privilege we have and use that privilege to be um, a tool for change. Mm -hmm. Often think of the admonition of uh, Professor John Powell, who said we can all be a part of the circle of human concern. It certainly starts with voting and engaging in our political process, but voting and engagement is just the beginning. What can you do? What can you do at work? What can you do in your communities? Are you actively engaged in conversations about housing access and criminal legal system reform and education? Uh, different folks might be engaged in different ways, but use your skills and your privilege, whatever it is, um, to support the work of individuals and organizations fighting for justice if you can't fight for it yourself. March, call your elected officials, go to meetings, donate, do all of those things, do any one of those things. So Deborah, um, we wanna thank you for joining us on the SIP. We really appreciate it. We know you're busy, 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 because we know all of those civil liberties, civil rights <laughs> issues that are on fire right now require all hands on deck. So um, thanks so much and congratulations for your role, your new role at the ACLU. Um, we know that you'll be doing really big things. So um, thanks for joining us. Thank you so yeah. much. Now I'm gonna Bye. kick it over to Adrian. Um, oh, really? Hmm. Um, <laughs> You're not toddy. It's I, a hot toddy. I'm like, not toddy. I thought the, I thought the, oh, actually, I thought the song, song is hard. Hard. I thought Joan is Joan is, is hard. Hard. Joan is okay. Hard. See how y'all do, Joan? Um, <laughs> So, I mean, even though we are coming out of a holiday week, it was shortened week, there was so much, so much hot toddies to talk about. Um, and so let's not waste any more time. Let's just get right to it. Um, let's start with all these new variants of this here coronavirus. When all I these- I have my mask down and here. It's like on. <laughs> Well, I was, oh, you got your mask? I was like, where's my mask? See, acting like it's gone, and we have all these new Let's vote. variants of the virus. What are y'all doing, ladies? You it's know I'm still inside, so. <laughs> Someone called me, uh, Judith, the Judas from the, uh, from the Hill, and was like, we're about to do this meeting. And she's like, I'm calling you personally to let you know it's, it's, we're asking you to come in person. I was like. <laughs> You'll be doing that meeting without me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a reminder that we are still in a, a, a pandemic. I know we're going to talk a little earlier, um, you know, across the globe, you are seeing um, surges. I mean, the Olympics is literally, I have a whole, I don't even know if that's in the hot toddy today, but a whole thing about, I about the Olympics. And so weirdly, I'm actually happy that they've shut down the spectators, yep. but it's also so sad for the athletes. So yeah, yeah like Judith, yeah, they, Japan's like, we're in a state of an emergency. So we were going to let local people go see, um, the comp, the, 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 um, the competitions and now it's like zero nobody. Um, so it's still out there, y'all. And it is migrating and mutating and Lambda Delta. Yeah, Pfizer, Pfizer saying they're coming up with another a, a dose for the variant, like a booster shot. And yeah. I mean, we're not, people aren't all vaccinated in the first place. Like, right. what are you doing? Come on. <laughs> Well, I think they had they had talked about that, that we would all need a booster anyway, but that was supposed to be at some point down the line, like mm -hmm. next year, right? Like you get your regular flu shot or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but that we would have, and I'm and I'm definitely like, okay, hurry up, because I would like to get my booster. Like, where is I'd the like booster? To be first in line? Yeah, I just it seems. I mean, it's it's scary, um, and 
there, you know, we have had this moment where it feels like people really do want to start getting back out there. We had holidays, you know, the past holiday where people saw their families for the first time. I have a old friend who um, found out, you know, had, or not found out, but had a baby like nine days before the lockdown happened. She's just coming to Brooklyn for the first time to introduce the baby to her family. So, you know, people are starting to move around. Glenn and I obviously were on vacation. Um, and I felt like I came back from vacation and was like Glenda just said, felt like, okay, now, but now I can't leave my house again. Right. Because I've been trying, I was thinking, I was trying to figure out where to go on vacation, but now I'm scared because I there's a window in place and I feel like some of shut down. Right. Places are going to get by the fall. I think by yeah, the fall. Um, Jerry has a player who's in, um, who's supposed to play basketball in Taiwan and they're like, they're shut down. He can't even get back over there to play. It's, it's, it's coming y'all. Yeah, I thought I, I was at, I, I hate it for the athletes, but I never, I thought they should have canceled those Tokyo Olympics anyway, because we had never gotten to the point where we were, we weren't free of this. And, you know, you're bringing people from all over and, it, you know, even if you don't have audiences, it's still you're still um, putting the uh, uh, athletes at risk. They're just, um, they were just starting to check in and they already had three of the athletes test positive. And again, oh, wow. athletes from all over the world. Over the world right. And this all different COVID kinds. is being handled yeah. differently in different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I am going to keep my mask on. Yes. I will, you know, keep my little butt in the house as much as possible because... Yeah, because they said there were a couple of times like the, you know, it, the variants broke, broke through to people yeah. who were vaccinated. So yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not trying to have that. So we will be talking about that for a while as we are all staying in um, our homes. Um, as a proud Howard alum, I have to bring up Hannah, Nicole Hannah Jones and her eloquent CMA, KMA to UNC <laughs> after getting her tenure. Yeah, I'm sticking up my middle finger without doing it. <laughs> yeah, because I don't, I don't want to curse on the show, but that's what she did to UNC. <laughs> Not it wouldn't be the first yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> I mean this is just beautiful. This is like I was I was saying to, to y'all yesterday. This is like you know USC is all in crisis. Meanwhile, black people plotting like Harriet Tubman. They're like, yeah, we 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 know where we can go. We got a strategy. We ain't waiting around for y'all. Oh, you gonna get no? That's okay. Thank you. It's yeah. and by the way, everybody needs to you know I'm ready to enroll at Howard like for some kind of graduate degree to be up in there. I'm like, can I go back? Can I go back? <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of things here, right? People, it is it isn't insignificant of determining not to take tenure at a place that you've worked very hard to do. But that you graduated also, she, from. she is uh, uh, a poster child for knowing in, in knowing your worth, right? And, and knowing when you like, I I've got to go where people want me, because you know her body of work as an academic. This is what any institution would want from an academic who's on a tenure track, who is right, you know, researching and writing on one, the topic that's her specialty. Um, and so I think for me, it even just as as we all navigate our own leadership, this shows you the notion that if you're sitting somewhere and you feel undervalued um, or mistreated or not a place for you to be your best, um, that oftentimes black women don't feel like we have the luxury to be like, I'm out. We tend to keep this, like, it's a safety net. It's the ability to do something that I think it was very inspiring um, of the notion of what's best for me uh, and how I best can show up for an institution who invests back into me. I think that's a really good point, Glenda. I mean, I feel like there's also the like, you know, like black women multitask all the time. And so one of the things that we have to remember is that we can do that. And so we can be developing our exit strategy mm -hmm. as we are wrapping up, right? And maybe in our own minds, the thing that we are doing so that we actually can move on to a different place. I also just feel like, um, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones is sitting um, on the leading edge of opening up 
not just conversations in this country, right? Because obviously the 1619 Project, when it uh, even before it came out and we were all talking about it, and then when it came out, really opened up this conversation about coming to terms with our history, but also understanding the ways that systemic racism lives um, in our current systems as a result, right, of that history. Um, that really opened up in many ways this, this as a national conversation, mm -hmm. right? That then got picked up by Democratic, you know, primary candidates for president etc. Um, that was really important. She's now opening up a new conversation, really, I think, for HBCUs, right? And for those people who I think, as she put it, really should be thinking about taking their talents to HBCUs because that's where, you know, a lot of the, many of our young people who are going to be developed to, you know, sort of go out and lead the charge for what our evolving democracy needs to be, that, that's where they're going to learn at. Um, and so it really is this fascinating new conversation, I think, and I'm really excited to see what happens around it, um, how we begin to look at and lean on and trust um, HBCUs um, for the development of this kind, not just intellectual property, but also new leaders. Yeah. And so I, I'm definitely excited. I was a uh, graduate of the School of Communications at Howard, and I would love to go back under these two. But I also love the fact that, um, you know, it just infuriates me that the main person who put all of this um you know, challenging her there, this main donor who did not do any of the work in journalism, who once again inherited his his media empire, who won no prizes, has the nerve, the absolute gall, to challenge a Pulitzer Prize winner, multi-award winning journalist who's worked her way up and I, I'm so glad I was I was praying that she would do exactly this, get the tenure and say deuces. So um, I'm so happy about that. And, I, and it is that lesson to us um, to go where you're celebrated and not just tolerated. Yep. So, yep. Oh, gosh, there's so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about Tabitha Brown and her response to Wendy Williams. Well, you have to you have to lean in and whisper. Yeah, a whisper, a whisper. Because I had just got up this morning. <laughs> I'm praying I, that you find somebody that loves you, Lord, and sees you. I well, I I really love Tabitha Brown, <laughs> and I I really so when I I will say that I started really paying attention to her when you all remember last year, I think, at some point last in the last 18 months when my husband decided in the midst of a pandemic to be a vegan. And so I was like, what, what you gonna eat? Right. <laughs> so I had a bunch of like, okay, well, what's Tabitha Brown doing? Right. Um, but she is just so, I mean, her, um, like to, to watch her kind of evolution, um, you know, on her platforms has been really great to just to watch. And I, you know, and, and when there are these moments of tension, the way she really does handle them in a way that I, you know, like I feel like not many people can do, right? And so even this little incident where, and I believe she was sincere, um, it was a, you know, in her like you know, I pray that you find happiness because you are clearly an unhappy person, right? Um, but to say it in a way that really was, she did, you know, sort of grounded in caring, yeah. um, but then sliced her up. Right? <laughs> Good old Christian Reed. Good old Christian Yes. Reed. And if I remember, I read somewhere, because there's a ton of, like, obviously, me like, memes going around with her. It also was this part. Two things. You know, she's been an influencer. Like, we all, like, remember, uh, Sonia uh, and Tracy and I were following her early. With, was it the TT? With the, the, uh, we out here trying to find the the vegan <laughs> um, T. What was it called? TT? TLP, that TT, that Tempe. Uh, yeah. It was good. <laughs> this FYI, if y'all ever had it, it's a thousand calories. Yeah, I was about to say it's good, but it's like it's seven so hundred billion calories. Like bacon in itself has less calories than this thing. Um, so we had been following her for a while. So I certainly, I think she's recognizing kind of where she is now in this um, influencer celebrity. And so I think her ability to kind of have her first like full fledged, I'm gonna come check you and create a space for me and my family. But then she then announces that she done got a McCormick deal for a yeah. spot. So you know why my husband can retire, stay out my pocket because I'm building my empire. 
Mind your business. Mind your business. Mind your business. Wendy's just messy. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. every situation ain't your situation. So, Mm -hmm. and there is something. I mean, I think one of the things that that uh, that Miss Brown said in in her read was, you know, I hope that you find someone who will say to you that I know you're not well, right? And I feel like that's a thing that you know that everyone needs is, is someone who can say you have to sit down like something's like something is very very off here mm-hmm. um and so she's you know she was not wrong in any of the things that she said not at all. as she leaned in and said as she leaned in with, with love with love i'm gonna work on that that's gonna be yeah, because i don't yeah that's I'm bless you that. my sister my yeah, sister I'm, I'm not gonna work on it. We know that. We know <laughs> you know right. we, we know that Judith and Adrian will not. Shut yeah. up. <laughs> that would take away my edge. I ain't trying to take away my edge. <laughs> but as we talk about not being well, let's talk about our girl Naomi on, on the cover of mm-hmm. Time magazine. And and we talk a lot about mental health here, mental wellness, and the idea of just normalizing that it's okay when you're not okay. You know, you, you, it's okay. It's okay to say it. It's okay um, to seek help for it. And we just need to talk about that more, especially with everything that's going on, especially young people. I feel like there's just so much happening with our young people now um, that we have to be, say it's okay. It's, it's perfectly okay when you're not okay. Mm-hmm. She's just, I mean, she has so much courage. I mean, first from what she did in terms of the masks that, you know, were her sign of protest and, and awareness, raising awareness. She, I mean, cause let's put it in perspective. She's very young, right? Like she, this is not like someone in their twenties or thirties, right? She's very young. Um, and to be able to say, I'm not okay. And, and I will say this, that I think the, the thing that I'm also proud of is the fact that there is a shift in the conversation around mental health in the black community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that shift is opening up the ability for people to say, I'm not okay, and to get some help. Yeah. And that is really important. And for people in her position, um, because there's also been a, um, a number of NFL players who've been doing some work around mental health awareness, um, this is important because for too long, We've just like, you know, like, don't talk about it. Like, don't talk about that, right? Like, oh, they're crazy, right? Like, I mean, just like those kinds of things that didn't allow for people to raise their hands and say, I need help. So I, you know, I applaud her for helping shift the conversation and for black, for her, especially as a young black woman to open up the door of this conversation. Absolutely. I also think it's important. Um, well, one, she, I see finds places to use her platform. Um, I certainly don't think she thought this was going to be the thing um, that she would lean in. Um, but given how um, the French Open um, handled the situation, it created this platform for her. And I think it's important to talk about the um, the the variety of um, like how mental illness can show up in your life. People have a very clear. They, we believe we have an understanding of what mil- mental illness is, and then the fact that most of us are functionally struggling through some type of mental, you know, mental illness or uh, uh, an episode. And so the notion of depression and how does depression show up in high achieving, high functioning people? For her to talk about anxiety because people don't um, associate anxiety with mental illness, I think is an important thing because most of us, um, Sonia and I were talking uh, maybe a week ago about this notion of black women, like why are we like having the Pope be posed a question of why are we suffering yes right and um i think it's an important conversation that you could be every day or high functioning and that 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 we don't have to suffer mm-hmm. yeah it, and we don't see it often it's just the, it's just how we do like that's right. just how we right, do because we carry so much and we just keep going just because that's what our mothers and grandmothers do. just keep going oh you, you're gonna be okay yeah. Right? Instead of being like, no, I'm not okay. And now you look back on, oh, so maybe that was the problem with grandma or aunt or somebody and just not know. Mm-hmm. That's right. Gosh, there's so much. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I don't want to generalize, but I just feel like it, it's always 
this this issue in Haiti. You know, there's always something, and the the recent assassination uh, of the president was just. It's been quiet, but as you know, there's countries across the globe that are politically unstable, and oftentimes it doesn't go away after a headline, right? The instability. Um, same, this whole debate around um, Biden pulling all our troops out in, you know, in the Middle East, you know, in the Middle East and Afghanistan. The notion of it is still a volatile, um, unstable political structure or um, government. And so Haiti has been out of the headlines, um, Mm -hmm. frankly, out of the headlines on infrastructure rebuild from earthquakes and and hurricanes. Um, And so certainly I woke up because I still, I know many of us have turned off our alerts. I've turned mine back on for AP News. And I was was like, is this a new movie coming out? It was very right out of a motion picture yeah. episode of being, because obviously countries have had assassinations of presidents. I'm thinking you're walking, you know, parade, you're doing like someone going into the, the, um, into your home in the middle of the night when you're sleeping with your wife is just jarring for me. I, I, you know, I think that Haiti is not, has been out of the news because we just, the international community just continues to ignore it, right? Like, like the, there's been, no, and I think this is your point, Glenda, like, the, you know, massive earthquakes, all sorts of um, economic um, strife, and we just, and, and it just doesn't get covered. And it does feel like, and I think, Sonia, maybe this is, was your, the, your you know, your, the just behind your opening comment, which is, you know, the world, uh, con- it just feels like the world continues to punish the first free black nation, right? Um, and this is, I mean, obviously there's questions around who who rolled up in there, right? I think, um, you know, and knowing that it will, it will cause increased instability in a nation that was already struggling with instability. Um, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And I, you know, I think that's, you know, to your point, it's like how, one thing after another, constantly, constantly, constantly. Um, and at some point, you know, we have to have um, leadership in the United States, certainly, and in other places as well, that just decides that, you know, we're not that the, the, the international community will not be allowed to just ignore the suffering um, of, of the Haitian people. And also the Biden administration is going to have to come back and do something about the immigration status of Haitians yes. in the United States. Yes. Stop uh, playing around with that. Right. Yeah. That will and we'll, because we'll see an increase in the number of people that have to they have to get out. Right. That's right. Uh, yeah. So what do we think as we're talking about all of the um voter suppression laws that are happening around state by state around this country um, about our vice president's announcement uh, about the um, 25 million for uh, the DNC for voter registration efforts ahead of the midterm elections. Wow. (laughs) So number one, okay, good. That's not a lot of money, but okay, good. (laughs) And right. And, um, you know, we, this doesn't mean that the Dems are off the hook for passing this <laughs> for the People Act and the John Lewis Voting, uh, Voting Advancement Act. And so that, you know, we still got to get that done. And I do think this is an all hands on deck moment where we need the DNC to do some real work on the ground. Because the thing is that we're... We're at a moment where we're going to see when these state legislatures go back into session in January, it, the floodgates are open for voter suppression because yeah. now they know it's going to be harder for us to prove discrimination. So, you know, we we need everyone um, working on this. Yeah. And I think, uh, Judith, you were correct. Just making the distinction as I was talking to some friends and colleagues is that this is um, $25 million in political money. Right, which is separate in a part of us continuing to hold the administration and Congress uh, accountable about what does like real 
like voter voting rights expansion, <laughs> protection and expansion look like. Um, and so I will say from all of our work from 2017, um, uh, where, you know, over, uh, you know, 30 um, black women really put, black women leaders push the DNC around investments. Um, this is a early investment for the Democrats. Um, and so we need to continue to go where, how is this being spent? How do we expand this um, on the political side as we continue to look at the work that is happening um, um, on the Hill and um, at the White House. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I, I think I was going to say something similar, Glenda, which is so there is a there is real need out there in terms of resources to be able to expand the electorate, right? To be able to bring new folks in, to be able to register. We've seen lots. We've seen huge gaps in voter registration um, over the last cycle, particularly with with young people, but not exclusively. And so, any resources that can go to bringing people into the, the process is fantastic. Um, and I think that hopefully they, you know, that the, the DNC is open to, um, you know, uh, hearing folks out about where money sh might go or should go, um, not just in terms of, you know, uh, potential partners, but in terms of actual geography. Um, and then, but then I think the, but Judith, I, I think that there is the, that, the point that you just made after the civil rights, the legacy organization leaders um, met with the Biden folks yesterday, and then the vice president made that announcement. That's great. And we need to do that. And also in the filibuster. Like, how about that? Like, can we let's let's have an entire full core press because we're not getting any of this with as long as the filibuster stays in place the way that it is. And I, I also just want to see how they are going to. My big problem with uh, the Democrats right now is we, the messaging and the narrative is always off to me. And for the party that is supposed to have the majority of the creatives and, and those thinkers in it, we just never seem to have the right narrative and the right messaging for the right audiences that we need to move. And I would hope that in some of this work as you're trying to register new voters, that you are really looking at how you are messaging to the folks that you need to message to, especially like now you're in and you have a lot of people who say, well, I voted for y'all and I don't see anything yet. Like, how do you, how do you do that? You know, the Republicans are great at, you know, evil geniuses at, at, at messaging. And, um, I would just hope that we, we get better <laughs> basic, you know, to say the least that we, we, we get better at it. Um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We shall see. Um, gosh. What else? Shakari Richardson? I not going to the Olympics? I was going to say swim caps at the Olympics. Swim caps. Black women getting banned from the Olympics. <laughs> so much. So, so much. much. <laughs> um, but please still watch. I remember the sister was like, there's so many black people saying they're going to boycott. And when we have so many folks there to, to cheer on, so yes. let's still cheer because you know we got to cheer Simone in the in thing. We got to you know Simone on the gymnastics, Simone in the water. Right. Um, <laughs> the, the sister from Harvard, you know the neuroscientist who is also a track star. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of folks to a lot of black girls. For everybody black. Yes. And, and sure. we have to cheer loud on the social media because we are literally the fans because it will be no one sitting. We're the audience. <laughs> we are the audience. I'm not boycotting. Could you imagine working that hard for your whole life and then there's no audience? Yeah, I mean, it's a catch-22. I agree. I, my thing is it needed to be a wash for four years for some of the athletes who are, this was their last Olympics. I know you can't get to, you know, their bodies as elite athletes that extra four years. But I was like, this is so, if this was my first, I'd be like, this ain't fair. <laughs> right, exactly. I'd be walking around the little, around the um, circle. And go, this ain't right. I've been working all my life. All my life. <laughs> if I had to fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for joining us for this Power Hour conversation um, uh, with the SIP um, host 
And we look forward to having a conversation next week on a conversation about Black women entrepreneurs. And so we are so excited that our girl, Sonia Lockett, uh, was a guest host today. Thanks for holding down hot toddies. And thanks to our host, Judith Brown Dianis, Adrian Shropshire. Um, our girls, Tracy Sturdivant and Fatima Goss Grays, are off, but Sonia held it down. Uh, <laughs> I'm Glenda. Two people. Car. <laughs> two <Good>. people. <laughs> I'm Glenda Carr. So, Sonia, I'll kick it to you quickly to pull your, your cup up until we sip again. Look <laughs> forward to gathering next Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Bye, everybody. Bye.